Welcome to another edition of Dad's Divorce. Today we have with us the litigation manager of our Illinois offices, Richard J. Coffey. Mr. Coffey, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to speak with us today. Always a pleasure, Dan. And we have an article that's posted on our site um, titled Safeguarding Premarital Property, which you were the author of. And today we're going to discuss certain aspects on how to protect your property, which you have outlined in the article. One of the first things that you addressed is community property law states. Uh, are the majority of the, of the uh, states operating under the community property laws? Well, as I list up there, there's a, there's a handful that have formal community property statutes, Arizona, California, Idaho, Louisiana, Nevada, New Mexico, Texas, Washington, Wisconsin, and uh, the territory of Puerto Rico. Uh, and I do not practice in a community property state, so I'm not about to venture into that area. And so I've prefaced my article with the comment that I'm not dealing with those states. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I move on to the states that, that don't have those statutes and dealing with some of the basic issues that we see with preserving the premarital property. One interesting um, topic that you discuss in your article, which comes up a lot in um, dealing with clients in initial consultations, are the validity and drafting of a premarital agreement, or what's also known as a prenuptial agreement. Right, and, that, and we've all seen those, those of us who practice in this field, People come in with things that they wrote up on the eve of getting married, didn't have attorneys handle it, even had one come in in the, in the classic cocktail napkin where they'd written down what they wanted to do. And it's unfortunate that in most situations those are not going to be enforceable. Now, there's a, a statute referred to as the Uniform Premarital Agreement Act that about 26 states have adopted that addresses the hows and wherefores of preparing a proper premarital agreement. Uh, most of the other states uh, have some case law or statutory reference to premarital agreements, but they don't dictate the method or the content of those agreements. Is there a general method or like a general context or content that these premarital, prenuptial agreements need to be drafted? Well, the negotiations of them have to be fairly well documented. Uh, as you know, people are in a positive attitude usually as they're getting married. Uh, they're trusting each other. They're looking forward to their marital life. And they really don't want to do their due diligence that you might do uh, in any other kind of partnership. So uh, they need to have a full disclosure to each other of everything so that the parties can effectively deal with it in the premarital agreement. And that's the most difficult part, because a lot of people don't maintain those kind of inventories uh, or lists to be able to fully disclose every asset or every potential uh, source of income in the future. Now, if they list what they think, to the best of their knowledge, is a complete and entire accurate uh, compilation of their assets and later down the road that's discovered that there's something that they missed, can they supplement that or add an addendum and, it's, and that premarital or prenuptial agreement still be valid? Well, that's going to depend upon the laws of the individual states involved. Anything that you do after you get married is always subject to debate as to whether it was intended to be a gift, whether it was intended to rescind the premarital agreement, because the marriage has occurred and the, the uh, transaction has been completed, if you will. So that's going to depend upon the specifics of the states involved. It's also going to determine, be determined on how significant the asset is. A very minor asset should not disrupt the premarital agreement. A major uh, non-disclosure gives rise to the assumption that you did know about it at the time or you should have known about it at the time. So it can get very uh, complicated down the road uh, once the premarital agreement has been executed, the marriage has been uh, concluded, and then something changes. And that's one of the other issues I talk about in the article, is not only drafting the premarital agreement is very technical, but implementing it also requires a lot of monitoring. 
Well, we've got people who are listening or clicking on to the podcast and are thinking, well, how is it hard to implement if both parties willingly signed the premarital agreement? Well, it's very simple for the parties when they're having a, a very good relationship to waive any provisions, whether intentionally or unintentionally. You may set up a very formal system of accounting because you want to keep your premarital house totally non-marital, but then you let your spouse pay for repairs or write the, the check out of her account for a mortgage payment because you're on the way to the bank or you're on the way to the post office or some other accommodation that you make as a married couple uh, that later, if the marriage dissolves, will be used to show that the premarital agreement was not followed to the letter and should not be enforced. So we're dealing with potentially co-mingling. Co-mingling is, is the key there in, in the premarital agreement because it's designed to, to build a wall between the assets. And once you start commingling them, uh, then uh, you create a presumption that you no longer are following the agreement and it has become void. Uh, the agreement may also deal with maintenance, which is a separate issue that we're not dealing with in this article, and that raises different issues as well. And that would be a good topic for a, a later podcast. But keeping on track with the article that you have written, can uh, one of the parties waive an interest in the marital or in the actual residence? It can be structured to allow that to happen. And then that Most, way to try to avoid any co-mingling? Yes, but the problem there is that Illinois, and I think most other states are going to say, the marital residence is special. That's where you've invited this person to join your partnership and live with you. And there's an expectation that both of you will maintain the residence. And therefore, anything you do to appear to commingle uh, interests in the house is going to be read against you. Uh, so in the article, I, I mentioned that there's extreme measures you could take to create a, a land trust to own your house and then lease it back to yourself if it's that important or uh, make some other accommodations again so that the spouse is not providing any financial input into the residence they're always going to be providing some uh, physical labor uh, but that's not going to necessarily detract from the non-marital effort unless it is a, a remodeling project of some kind uh, but you need to maintain the records and keep the accounts separate and keep the uh, payments on, on the property that you want to keep separate as separate as possible. And, the, and again, the main problem is when it's the marital residence, when it's the personal vehicles, when it's the day-to-day -day bank accounts, that these things arise. When you have rental property, when you have uh, investments that don't require regular intervention or, or withdrawals or deposits, you can set those up leave them alone, never touch them essentially, and they will stay non-marital. But when you start commingling things, that's when the problem arises. You mentioned a land trust. How is that set up? Well, it depends again on the jurisdiction that you're dealing in. Sure. And, and we don't do real estate law, but I have done real estate law in, in my 30 years of practice. And there are mechanisms to create a entity to own the real estate and then rent it back to the uh, individual who lives there and provide for who gets it when that individual dies and other mechanisms to create more of a business model than a uh, marital model for how the residence is handled. What effect does foreclosure have on this type of a situation? On the Did marital home, it creates a lot of... Uh, uh, problems when it's the non-marital uh, property. Uh, the other issue, the other side of the coin, is when you want when one of the parties acquires a property during the marriage, and those are two different issues. The uh, Most states prohibit a, a bank from seizing your home unless you give them the right to do so in your mortgage, which most mortgages provide. So when you have a non-marital home that the parties are living in, and the owner spouse is foreclosed upon, that's going to put the non-owner spouse out of a home. Right. And so they may feel the need to try to bail out the house, in which case they're going to commingle funds and create 
the marital interest in what was non-marital. When the parties are married and then want to purchase individual properties, uh, particularly a residence for themselves, and they want to keep it uh, in their individual names, then there's going to be a requirement of waiving of this homestead right so that the bank can foreclose. As I point out in the article, one of the common ways that uh, one spouse inadvertently creates joint ownership in the marital home that they had thought they were keeping non-marital is when they refinance. And the bank wants 